is actually problem five, not four, because uh, five is more fun. I have an actual demo for that. Um, so uh, problem four is, um, we'll talk about it because it's important. Actually problem four relates to, um, so I told you earlier in the semester that we are never going to deal with the pseudo forces in this class. And problem four is one of the earliest, um, earliest example why we shouldn't deal with the pseudo force. So, so we'll do problem four, but let me do, I have an actual bucket that I can put water in and actually spin, so let, let's do problem five as a fun demo. So you guys kinda know what would happen if I took this, let me clean up my sink, if I took this bucket and turned it upside down, right? What would happen? Yeah, water would fall down. <laughs> Everyone here believes in gravity. <laughs> um, so now, from your experience, do you have any sense what would happen if I took this? Uh, let me do it over there. I don't want to damage the projector accidentally. So do you have some sense what would happen if I took this and if I spin it? You know, so if I spin it all the way around one full circle, will the water drop out? No, if you go fast enough, it won't. Yeah, let's see. Yeah, if I go fast enough, and in fact, the question I'm interested in, how slow can I go before the water will start to fall out? So let me try going you know, slower and slower until water will fall out. So now, yeah, that wasn't very fast, but water barely starts to fall out as it's going over, right? So, so what's happening to the water? When I'm going fast enough, why doesn't the water fall out? Is there no gravity at the top? So we would, I would like to analyze this picture. So let me draw a figure and, uh, yeah, let me draw the figure and yeah, let's try analyzing it using the physics that we know. Because the, you know, the promise of the centric, the circular motion and centripetal acceleration is that we are not actually introducing any new physics. I said this last time, even though, even though um, centripetal acceleration and centripetal force, it's not, and there's nothing new that I'm bringing in. It's just a mathematical analysis of something that I already had. So somehow we should be able to make sense of this bucket without introducing anything new, uh, without introducing anything that we didn't already know. So let me call this worksheet five, problem five, spinning bucket. So I'm going to draw the picture of the bucket at a snapshot. Just uh, the moment when it's at the very top. So I will draw it as a snapshot. There's water here. But what I want you to remember is that even though I'm dr drawing it as a snapshot, you kind of should remember that this bucket is moving, that it has a velocity v that, keep, that keeps it moving, moving in a circle. Good. All right. So. Uh, let me redraw the bucket. I don't actually need the two strings. All right, so I'll just pretend that I had only one string. All right, um, so we would like to figure out what forces are keeping this water in the bucket because it's apparently not falling out, right? So what do you do when you are trying to analyze the forces? Something you have to do for exam one. Where do you start? You start out with a free body diagram. So we are going to try to apply standard strategy because this is apparently a force problem. So, um, so hopefully standard strategy will work. So um, all right, let me start out with a free body diagram of water. Even though the water is a, it's a liquid, I'm going to treat it as if it's a, one solid object, or you know, if that bothers you too much, you can pretend that I did this. Instead of having water in the bucket, I mean, I do water because it's more dramatic, but I could have actually put a golf ball in the bucket, and it would have been the same thing. Do you see the golf ball at the top? Ooh. Sorry, that's why. <laughs> so let me do it with this one. It, uh, the tennis ball is easier to see. So I could have done the exact same thing with the tennis ball. When, you, when I spin it, do you see the tennis ball staying at the bottom of the bucket or you know, at the very top as I'm spinning it, it's not falling out. 
So, you know, so for the purpose of the analysis, we'll treat water like it's a, it's a solid. It's one single material instead of liquid that might um, pour out. So let's say this is the, my representation of water. So question is, what are the forces on the water? Always gravity. Somebody was uh, whispering gravity, right? Yes, OK. <laughs> so there's going to be gravity pulling it down, right? All right, um, let's keep going. What, any other forces on the water? No more force. Um, OK, it has three walls, right? Uh, I'm going to say no more force from the left and the right walls. They will cancel, balance out. So I'm only going to worry about the normal force from the bottom of the bucket. What direction is the normal force? Yeah, normal force only pushes away from the surface. So normal force will, okay, that, um, all right. Um, that's not exactly helpful in keeping the water up. Any other forces on the water? Anything else that's touching the water? That the normal force is from bucket. Uh, it's touching the bucket, not the water. Uh, what's touching the, so watch touching the water to give you that centrifugal force. Yeah. So you think if I did this in vacuum, water will fall out? Right. Not really, right? Or you know, if we, you imagine doing it with a tennis ball in vacuum. Do you, so in that question comes down to, is the air keeping the tennis ball up? No, no right? <laughs> so the air is touching it, but right now we are essentially neglecting air resistance. So once again, is there anything else t that's touching the water to exert any other force that's not drawn here? Yeah, there's no other force. Meaning, this is the complete free body diagram. There's, um, yeah, there's no other force that we didn't identify. Now, uh, using this diagram, we can talk about it a little bit. Um, so th this gravity, it'll always be mg, it won't go away. But this normal force, that could change, right? So let me uh, probe your intuition this way. Um, imagine I have this bucket you know, and the water in there. And imagine I'm spinning this really fast versus when I'm spinning this re relatively slow. How do you think normal force varies between when I'm spinning this fast and when I'm spinning this slower? Do you feel like normal force should increase or decrease as I um, spin it slower and slower? Decrease. Decrease, that there's less of a push, right? So, which means, um, which means as I spin this slower and slower, so this is what I was trying to do last time, that, you know, try to get the water to fall out. So as I spin this slower and slower, one thing I can imagine happening is that this normal force would decrease, decrease, decrease to the point of zero. So at this point is when the water is about to fall out. Does all of this make intuitive sense? Yeah? In fact, when there's no normal force, that's when, that's when moment when there's no uh, contact force between the bucket and the water. So the water is about to fall out really in that situation. All right, so this is the complete free body diagram of water that's about to fall out. I want to make sure that this makes an intuitive sense with you, that if I'm spinning bucket this way, so at this snapshot, the graph is pointing downward, there's no other force, and the water's not falling out of the bucket, and all of this is okay. This is the correct picture, by the way. I think the only part that might be misaligned or incorrect is for many of you, this might not sound intuitively true. And that's the part I want to provide some guidance to. So let me put it this way. What would it mean for this free body, this free body diagram to be actually correct? Like what kind of consequence do you see from saying that this free body diagram is the correct free body diagram? Yeah. 
Like, what are we drawing free body diagram for in the first place? I mean, OK, the object, what's the reason that we are drawing the free body diagram? Uh, sorry, um, take all first. To, to map all the forces that are in the water. Okay, map all the forces, and then you can find the net force. Why do we care about net force again? Direction acceleration. acceleration. Not only the direction, but the whole acceleration. Because of Newton's second law, right? Net force is equal to mass times acceleration. And that, this acceleration is why we care about the net force. So here, uh, you see the net force, the single gravitational force. So you see that acceleration. This is the acceleration that this free body, di free body diagram says is, well, is, that, that's what it is. So does it make sense to you intuitively that the water here, which is going in a circle, not falling out of the bucket, it's in fact at the same radius from this point, that this water is accelerating downward? OK, so tell me how it's accelerating downward when it's not. So you know, I think I'm OK with something that's at zero velocity. So you know, this, this water is at zero vertical velocity. I'm OK with that having downward acceleration, because that's like this and then dropping like this. Here, the difficulty would be, well, it's not dropping like this. It's uh, you know, moving in a circle. So, um, so, so Tell me how, what you can point to and say, this is why I expect downward acceleration. So we're going in a circle, acceleration is towards the center? Yeah, we are going in a circle. That means there has to be centripetal acceleration. So that's a, what I find is the most tricky part about circular motion. You see accelerations where you didn't expect to see any. So this is moving in a circle. It's moving in a path like this, right? So what that means is that every point of this path, it has a centripetal acceleration. Here, it has centripetal acceleration. Um, here, it has centripetal acceleration. Here, it has centripetal acceleration. And at each of these points, the magnitude of centripetal acceleration is given here. Centripetal acceleration is equal to V squared over R. So if anything is moving in a circle with some non-zero speed, then it's accelerating. So it, you know, learning to expect that, I think that's the biggest hurdle in doing well with a circular motion. So here, uh, I should have expected the centripetal acceleration from the beginning, because it's going in circle. Now, once you are expecting acceleration, then this is all perfectly fine free body diagram. It's saying that. Well, to have this acceleration, I need this force. So another way to put it is that this force that we have identified, we could call this centripetal force. This is the force that's keeping the water moving in a circle at the very top. Right? OK, uh, question, comment? Yeah. Change in the direction, yeah, 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 yeah. I mean, that's not surprising, right? It's that when you start to apply it, you know, there are ways that that expectation for the acceleration can be hidden. That's why you had to learn to watch out for it. So let's finish this problem. It asks, identify quantities. Oh, what is the uh, minimum speed so that the water doesn't fall out? So we already drew the picture where the water was just about to fall out. If I go any slower the water might fall out. So this is the picture where water is about to fall out. Force is mg. And so from that, we can say the net force in the vertical direction is, I'll say downward is positive, is equal to mg. And that's equal to mass times acceleration. Here, do we know what magnitude of acceleration, or do we have a way of re-expressing this acceleration? as centripetal acceleration. So that will be a common feature you see in circular motion problems. Um, you will have some expression that involves acceleration, and then you'll kind of be stuck there until you remember acceleration is also, centripetal acceleration is also given by this. So you can say V squared over R. Then now it relates to the, the radius R and the V that we are asking for. 
So we say this is equal to mv squared over r. Did I? They gave us r, right? Uh, oh, oh, quantities needed. All right, one of the quantities we needed is the radius r. That's one of the quantities. Um, so yeah, uh, masses cancel out, so I don't need to know the mass of the water. I can solve for v. And when I solve for v, I get v is equal to square root of rg. Okay. That's it, pretty simple question. Um, it's conceptually difficult um, because you have to get used to starting to expect whenever you have circular motion, you will have centripetal acceleration. Even when the picture doesn't look like there should be any acceleration. 